I remember re- reading this Debbie Harry article, like when I was doing a music festival and they were asking her something and she was like, the biggest advice I can say is don't be afraid of technology. And I was like, wow, like a 70 year old woman is like saying like, you know, just like always try to like embrace it. Focusing on the positive, I think with technology would be good until the robots come. Because then there's, <laughs> what are we gonna do? <laughs> Welcome to Keep It, Cricket Media show about pop culture and politics and what happens when they smack into each other at an alarming speed. I'm your host, Ira Madison III. I'm a television writer and Fallout Boy fan. I'm Louis Fertel. I'm a TV writer and Jane Fonda historian. Let's get into it. Our guest today is a comedian, actress, and author who, this is what it says, doesn't hold back. You are just like Bill Maher to me. After years of crushing audiences across the country with stand-up, as well as the historically hilarious show, Another Period, truly a fucking hilarious show. You wrote on it! I did. I did that one time. Uh, She is back with her new book, The World Deserves My Children, out now. It is the indefatigable and fabulous Natasha Leggero. Oh, thank you. That's funny because I thought it was pronounced indefatigable. You know, it could be. I, I feels a little bit more like Cole Porter sing-songy when you just say indefatigable, you know. Indefatigable. Wait. Indefatigable. <laughs> that too. That's us. <laughs> <laughs> you are in the right place. Um. Okay, well, thank you for that. Could I say it is not every comedian's, like, ambition to write a book. Like, they don't have it in them. Like, for me personally, I just like to say the joke and then I'm done with my work. But you, it's such a pleasure to read you on the page. Did you always consider yourself like a natural author? No, it was it was incredibly difficult and painful <laughs> and lonely. And it's such a different experience than stand-up because stand-up is like you try to get right to the punchline and you're very economical and succinct and a book is like the opposite. It's like, how do I stretch out, stretch this out and look at it from you know, every angle and, and, and make it deeper. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a totally different experience. One that I would not ever want to repeat. (laughs) Well, you barely survived it. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) But I will say it was during the pandemic. So I got a little lucky because all of my comedic ideas, uh, just sort of the book was almost like a depository for it because usually I would be on stage and performing. So I I was happy that I got to do all of this, um, you know, when we were all sort of had nothing to do. So here's a question then about that. And one I've wondered too with comedians who write books, obviously, you know, when you're on stage, you know, you're, you're pulling from a lot of material. Um, Do you feel like the book stuff is like off limits or are you like, who cares? I'm just going to use stories from the book when I do stand up again. You know, the stories from the book are some, there's like a little, little bits here and there, but I really tried to mm-hmm. make it its own unique thing. I, I wasn't, you know, like essays on different aspects, you know, like mm-hmm. parenting at the end of the world and freezing your eggs. And, um, but I actually have a bigger problem now, which is my daughter, when I say something she says to a friend and she hears me and she's four, she's like, mom, don't tell people what I say. And I'm just like, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. oh, uh, so that's, that's a new thing that I'm trying to figure out, which I guess is going to result in me not doing a Netflix special and just sort of touring on material about her. Mm. And then I guess not leaving any trail or trace. Uh, and then she'll never know. And I, I guess I'll pivot when she's 12. I don't know. It's, it's really challenging. I don't want her to hate me. Some no phones concerts, you know, do, do, do some of those. Uh, oh, no phones. So no, yeah. no, no phones. No phones. No phones. So there's no clips at all. Uh, <laughs> Madonna 2019 is your Bible. Yes. <laughs> I mean, how much is, is the right amount? to talk about your, because like so much of your life is your child and, Mm -hmm. you know, as a comedian and as artists and I'm, you know, you guys know, like, aren't you just processing what's happening in your life and talking about it? I mean, that's, that's how you, you know, create. So it is challenging when someone, even though they're four is like, don't ever talk about me. Uh, Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how to handle that yet. Now that's interesting though, because as somebody who's been on uh, Twitter as long as both Ira and I have, like before you had kids, would you see people talking about their kids and maybe like quoting them 
and and like roll your eyes a little bit be like Ugh, like that person's milking their kid i mean like i think if you're telling a story about a kid that's one thing but to be like <laughs> my kid said this one thing and it was so feminist or whatever it was yeah um, did you ever have a like a sour reaction to that it's funny because lewis i can tell that you that's how you feel <laughs> am i wearing my feelings on my sleeve yeah. <laughs> framed the question and you know no I, I don't really use her quote to to tweet or anything like that but you know sometimes she'll say things that are very cutting or you know like like when the pandemic was starting to almost be over but she still had to wear a kn95 mask indoors at school and then she said to me one morning she's like mommy when the pandemic's finally over can i wear any mask i want Hell and, yes, that's funny. So, so it's not even funny, it's just I'll use it to describe a mood or like a, a vibe or something, but tweeting it out, no. Saying it on stage, yes. So I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging, but also, you know, we have to give them autonomy. And I was hanging out with some woman and she brought her 10-year-old with, and some people were coming up to the 10-year-old and they're like, I recognize you from Instagram. And I was like, oh, God, I don't want that for my child. I mean, to be honest, I'm trying to keep her in a Waldorf school shielded from technology until high school. <laughs> but she'll probably hate me for that. So I don't know. Um, I mean, there is the trade off with that, right? And then, like, it's because it's always so funny to me when I see friends of mine upload photos of their kids to Instagram, but they have like the emoji face covering it or I something. Know. It's like, it's like, just take a photo by yourself at this point. I know, I know. <laughs> and it's like, sometimes the photo is so great, but I guess, I suppose I, I, I prefer that to like showing their, their teenage faces or their 10 year old faces. Cause that just seems like you don't want them to start to get hooked on like seeing, especially the girls, like if people are liking it or I don't know. I mean, we're fucked. <laughs> AI is coming. Time. I mean, what are we gonna do? Something that I think about with you that where I, I can't really come up with an answer is, as long as I have watched your comedy, you have always been like fully formed. You are not somebody who had to evolve. A, a quote I use all the time is, Cloris Leachman talking about Paul Lynn said he was born finished. Like you were always exactly the form you were in. And that makes me wonder, who were your actual influences? Like were there people that made you be like, oh, that's the thing I want to do? Because I, I can't really identify who that would be in my head because you've always just seemed like yourself. That's such an interesting question and a huge compliment. And I think that, yeah, when I first got up on stage, because I always was into like dressing up and, you know, and I, I remember when I first started stand up, I saw this quote and it was like, if you dress like the audience, you become one of them. And I always like had that in my head, like I need to always like be different or separate myself. And I mean, maybe that's, that's not for everybody, but for me, it like really kind of rang true. And when I think of all the people, like I, I've just always been attracted to glamour. But my first couple of years of stand up, I was afraid because I didn't want to bomb in a costume <laughs> because you're not good for a while, you know. So, um, but who are some of my influences? I mean, I, I always just loved like glamorous women, you know, uh, Liza Minnelli and Judy Garland and. Audrey Hepburn and Mae West, like anyone who was like over the top glamorous. Like I even remember being lit, like really little, maybe, I don't know if you guys have like early memories of glamor, but I just remember seeing like my nails painted red, like maybe I was seven and I had like a gold, a, a fake gold watch on and like looking at my hands and my gold and just thinking like, I need more of this. How do I get more of this? I mean, <laughs> I'm sure like Trump had a similar, <laughs> had a similar experience. I always had that, that energy of wanting that. I don't know. Do you think that I shouldn't admit that? <laughs> No, no, I would tell, say that's how it, it feels that deeply rooted to me. Like it, you would have to have been that young when you were like, "This is exactly what I'm going to be." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that even you say talking about glamour at a young age actually um, is connected to the pivot I wanted to make to a chapter in your book because uh, I feel like 
one of my earliest things of glamour was watching soaps with my mom. Like, mm, Younger and Restless, yes, Days of Our too. Lives. Like, Santa seeing Barbara's them, like, that one? Yes, of course I did. <laughs> yes, and see, like, the glamour that's in them is specific where it's like, you know, Marlena or Hope will be dressed yes. up to the nines in their living room during the day when someone comes over to just have a conversation with them. Um, and that was always glamour to me, like wearing heels or like a dress or like jeans in your home already. You're not lounging around. And you mentioned in your book um, when you were waitressing, um, a Days of Our Lives actress came in and you asked to get yeah. your headshot to like the casting director. Do you remember which actor it was or which character they played? Okay, oh God, that is such a good question. You because I still know watch the show. Oh, you do? I do. I do. Why did it's I like watch... <laughs> it's a perfect lunch break. I think it's a comfort thing. It is yeah, a comfort uh -huh. thing. It's a I'm perfect like out, lunch break. I'm trying to figure out how I watched so much soap operas in seventh grade. Like, weren't we at school? Like, I'm just so confused by how I just. Because you have to watch it every day to know what's happening, right? Yeah. I feel Truly. like during the summer and then also uh, sometimes they'd you get air. In the summer. Like, yeah. And then sometimes they'd air, like when you'd get out of school a little early, it would still be on TV, like during the school year. Okay. So, Vic, wait, is Victor Kiriakis, is that Days of Our Lives? Yes. That is John Aniston. Um, Jennifer Aniston's dad, and he died yesterday. May actually. he rest. Yes. Yeah. He died yesterday? He died yesterday, yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's so sad. He was an amazing actor. Um, so I believe the girl, was the woman like a ex-wife of Victor <laughs> I don't remember okay. exactly. I, I remember so he his had brown curly hair. I'm going to say this uh, narrows the field down to 36. Yes. Yeah. There's, 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 <laughs> there's Vivian... There's Kate, there's Carly. These Ira, the you're killing me with this. <laughs> Jill, it does something for you? It does, it does. I feel like I started with my uh, mom and grandmother watching, and then my family, my extended family, would watch like on holidays. Like ev all the women in the family watched it. And I come from a family of like largely women, um, except for my grandfather. Um, and so like watching them all the time, it was my way of having adult conversations with the women in my family, I feel like, because when they would be gossiping and talking about adult things, they'd also be talking about the soaps that they were watching. And so by watching, I feel like I then got to slip into the adult conversations that were going on. And then what happened is you watch it during the summer. And then friends, weirdly enough, friends in college would watch the shows too. Um, so after that, like I was just hooked. That's so interesting that you mentioned soap operas because I did kind of grow up on them, but I never really made the association of the glamour. So that's, uh, thank you for that. Speaking of glamour, I want to talk about another period for a second because I can think of no, th there's no other way to put this, better project for you. Like it was a combination of the like over the top glamour thing mixed with the like hilarious buffoonery thing. And rarely do those two things, I think, go together that like coherently. Is it literally daunting to come up with new projects for yourself after that? Because it's such a perfect fit for you. I know. I realized when we were shooting it Sundays, we were in this beautiful mansion and everyone's in like princess costumes. And then the crew would walk by and they're like plaid and kind of like ruin the vibe. And like, <laughs> I just remember thinking like, we purposely did a show where we just like are literally like princesses all day long. <laughs> so yeah, it is, it is challenging. I mean, what's better than that show is really just a podcast. As you guys know, it's like the easiest thing to do. Like I have a podcast with my husband, the endless honeymoon podcast. And like that to me is like the perfect thing as well, because I can just be myself. But yes, I love physical comedy. I love, you know, the glamour and the social commentary and, Yes, it, I, I wish that it wasn't, you know, behind nine paywalls, but, you know. That is a confusing thing, Comedy Central. Maybe next time. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, by the way, when I met you to write on that show, that's the only job where I've been asked, 
what do you know about the Gilded Age? And I hope I hope more employers in the future ask me that because I was like <laughs> racking my brain. I was like, William Jennings Bryan, uh, 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 you know, the uh, the St. Louis uh, uh, World's Fair, etc. I was like, tr- I was like trying to come up with stuff. I mean, the main thing you need to know about the Gilded Age is that it was like a time in history where everyone figured out so well, they didn't pay taxes yet. And so, you know, we've actually come full circle back to the wealth of the Gilded Age where like people were living in these crazy houses and having like, you know, tons of servants. I mean, there's not that many people living like that. Like in Montecito, I'm sure like Gwyneth and, you know, uh, there's a, there's plenty of women who are still or pe- people living in this kind of world. But I think that it's going and then of course all of the silicon valley people like it's all just gonna happen again i guess the disparity but um but yeah so it was more like the economic point of the gilded age of that like you know people were literally not paying taxes but they aren't now Mm -hmm. (laughs) so you know we're back we're back baby weirdly when I try to think about what I know about the Gilded Age, and I haven't even watched the HBO show, I feel I think about the fact that, particularly, I feel like our age group, um, the s- books that we read in school, like middle school and high school, were all Gilded Age books, and they pretty much have stayed the same way. Like it's Gatsby, um, Wharton, you know, like um, Ernest Hemingway. It seems like American education is stuck on the Gilded Age. That's you just... must have gone to a good school because I didn't read that stuff till college. <laughs> wow, really? Wow. They, they, they stuck us with that stuff in suburban yeah. Chicago. Yeah, um, in Milwaukee is where a lot I'm of from. Edith Wharton. So... A lot of Edith Wharton, yeah. yeah. I also associate you, of course, uh, historically with the Chelsea Lately Roundtable, and you were the Yale of the Chelsea Lately Roundtable. <laughs> if I turned turn in and you were there, I was like, oh, we're getting jokes. Okay, and it's going to be like on point, and she's going to have heard of this before. So uh, I want to thank you for that. I know, but but I think of all of the things I said, like I'm like, is someone going to make a compilation and just put it out there? Like, you know, I worked with Jessica Simpson last week, and I was like, I hope she hasn't like watched Chelsea. We, I remember she was a topic <laughs> for like two months and like yeah. Lindsay Lohan, Amy Winehouse, like all these people. Like, I just feel like it was just a different time where you didn't quite think about like, we were all less empathetic, I think. Mm. I also feel like we were really coming off a time when like things like the Comedy Central roasts were really popular. So mm-hmm. it was just all about like, go as hard as possible because somehow we accept that that means you're joking even harder, even if it's completely mean. Exactly. um, Exactly. And now, now I want to do a show where I just make fun of houses. That feels like (laughs) safe. (laughs) True. That's definitely true. But as you said before, you love doing your podcast. Do you miss anything about like panel shows being sort of central in comedy? Right. There, there aren't a lot of them anymore. Uh, Yeah. I miss like being able to go there, I guess, you know, because I do feel that now when you do a panel show, they're like, okay, but can you just make it nice or not mention drinking or can you, we're friends with them. So, you know, it's just like, there's just a million reasons why not to say anything. (laughs) So I guess, you know, it's a good time to pivot, uh, retire. I don't know. uh, Write a book, (laughs) write a book. Uh, it's, it's definitely challenging. I mean, what do you think? I, do you miss roundtables? I mean, I, I don't miss, like, digging on people, I suppose, but... Yeah, I mean, the only thing I miss is, like... I mean, I miss the kind of, like, rowdy nature of a show, like, from the 70s, like, The Match Game or something, where it seemed like everybody right. was just hanging out and drunk on absinthe or whatever they plied them with at the time. But, um, but I, I think podcasts generally do fill the niche, generally speaking. Yeah. And I, yeah, they've taken over. Right. I mean, it's like, Mm -hmm. I just heard now I've been listening to you guys' podcast. I want to listen to it every week. I'm like, uh, there's so many podcasts I want to listen to every week. It's like, how do, how do we do it? How do we, I I guess just like always having an earbud in and just sort of pretending like you're listening to your family is, uh, (laughs) is one way to do it. I mean, I assume the deal is like, and this has to be a female led thing. Like, some people are just able to multitask. I personally cannot listen to like 
actual conversations or actual comedy and then do anything else. But like all the women in my life seem to be able to do that. Well, that just means you're very in the moment, Louis. I, <laughs> you know my artistry. Very urgent. Yes. Right. I'm like Marina Abramovich. Yeah. You have to be present for it. And speaking of what you said too about, you know, like the work on um, panel shows and then you know, like, you're like, oh, I'm working with Jessica Simpson this week. Like, I hope she hasn't heard anything. You know, have you ever had a moment from, like, <laughs> that era of stand-up or, you know, like, the Chelsea Lately show or some other thing where you've, like, joked about someone and then had to work with them after and they specifically remembered you saying something? Or have you been lucky to escape that? No, I have escaped it. But, like, now that I'm mentioning mm. it mentioning it on your show, I'm like, some bored person is going to put together a compilation. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, I mean, it's hard because it's like, I, yeah, I, I guess I am, like, I want to make fun of TikTok and people are like, no, not TikTok. And it's just, everybody loves things in this like TikTok's like this god now, and and I, I I tried to go on on the flight yesterday because everyone keeps telling me it's fun, you love it, and I'm just like it's bad music, it's like a bunch of Kardashian children, it's like I I don't really uh, bad makeup, like I, I I don't really it reminded me of like America's Funniest Home Videos or something, but like I guess younger people, it was it was just like I I can't I can't go I can't do it. What do you guys think? Is there something I that, keep hearing? I, I keep hearing that if you go on it enough, algorithmically, <laughs> it will give you something of intelligence mm -hmm. that you care about. But that, I just don't want to put in that work. And so, also, like, I just would prefer <laughs> like Twitter jokes in a weird way. I'm a mm -hmm. weird like apologist for Twitter, which is, by the way, among the uncoolest things you can say. So, I like TikTok in that, but my specific TikTok times are like right before bed. Or like I'm stoned on the couch when I don't want to be reading things on Twitter. But I feel like my algorithm has got me to, I do less of the like America's Funniest Home Videos kind of things. Like I feel like the funniest people on TikTok are the people who use their stream of consciousness and just sort of say things. And then it's very mm -hmm. brief. It's almost like you are watching them tweet it out but they'd rather just say it like i enjoy that and then i get like a lot of random like dancing and cooking videos so i wish you could like check boxes and you wouldn't have to wait for an algorithm like to pick mm, to, like for these them are to my interests <laughs> or like if there was like a tier like what's the highest tier what's the snobbiest version of tiktok that you could possibly feed mm. me you know that that would be nice one thing i like is they actually have they're actually um I see a lot more stand-ups now. Oh, that's good. Well, a lot because a lot of like Comedy Central and other places have started uploading clips from people's stand-up specials, and so that you they like they come into my algorithm a lot. So I do just see a lot of people doing jokes. Okay, well, you know what? I mean, it's just like we have to be able to pivot, and it is like I remember re reading this Debbie Harry article, like when I was doing a music festival, and they were asking her something, and she was like. The biggest advice I can say is don't be afraid of technology. And I was like, wow, like a 70 year old woman is like saying like, you know, just like always try to like embrace it. And I, it was like such a weird thing because I, I would imagine someone like her would be the opposite. And, you know, it's, it's inspiring when you see that people have that point of view because I feel like such a Luddite and it definitely holds me back. Um, but you know, if focusing on the positive, I think with technology would be good until the robots come, because then there's, what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they win. Right. Um, uh, my last question for you is obviously your podcast with Moshe is so great. Uh, I, I, I'm sure Ira has too. I've been on a uh, love it or leave it with him a number of times. I've known him over the years. What projects have you yet to do with him that you would like to do? Oh, I'm trying to cap it, honey. I'm I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> we have our podcast. It's twice a week. We take we have like a secret hotline. So it's like there are so many things you want a husband to do for you, you know, like with the kid and with the house and with, you know, his share of what we're trying to like, you know, just like keeping 
the uh, keeping things like afloat and out of you know if we're still in survival mode that the, the creative stuff piled on top of it can be very challenging so i actually try to use the podcast as a way to um you know kind of uh hijack him with some of the issues I have like almost as couples therapy so if I bring him something in the podcast and he doesn't know about it then people can weigh in and oftentimes humiliate him um into (laughs) not doing the thing anymore so I've actually found it to be like a really useful a tool in our relationship but in terms of doing more things no I think I'm good uh no more kids uh no more I don't know. Maybe if he wrote a movie, I would like do a part, but he, not if he's directing it. <laughs> 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 That's nice that you're just like, I use the podcast to pillory my husband and he in return becomes better. That's nice. Well, because you know, I don't know what he thinks is normal. Like, you know, he was using my toothbrush like every day for like a year and I like mentioned on the podcast and people were like across the board like no this is not something you do you know so I I that's curtains (laughs) (laughs) that's that's (laughs) that that is that is a that is that is like body horror Oh, I'm seeing my. when you see anyone lift up your own toothbrush you're like please stay away from that how about when you put it in your mouth for in the morning and it's soaking wet? Absolutely yes. not. Oh yeah. God, it's giving so, Cronenberg. I can't. I yeah. Can't. <laughs> yeah. Mm. But he was so shamed and horrified in a way that he does not get because he like you know he's the person he always wins every argument. He's he's so articulate and he just he went out and bought like forty toothbrushes. I'm not kidding. Just like the and just to have them there. So that he could like always know where he could find one if he needed to. Like he has not done it since, and yeah, it was really effective. <laughs> <laughs> I say it was worth it. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely worth it. Um, Natasha, thank you so much for being here and for just being exactly Natasha Leggero. You are hilarious consummately, and of course, her book "The World Deserves My Children" is out now. Thank you guys so much. You were so funny. I love your podcast, and thank you for making time for. For little old me. My God, of please. Course. We're always, we always are bandying, like, who should the third po- uh, permanent host be if we have one? You, you, you should come on whenever you want. That's how I'll I come guest host whenever you need. <laughs> <laughs> 